faces haunt me every night of my life. That's Robert McNamara. He's like Oedipus. I told you the other day that Oedipus did a terrible thing. He killed his mother and he comes back to Athens. He said, I've suffered for what I've done enough. Just accept me now in the way that Elsie and his family accepted uh, Jack McKinnon. Just take me in. You'll get the riches out of that that you won't be able to believe. I made a terrible mistake in Vietnam. It was because I didn't have, nor did this government have, any empathy for the Vietnamese, whom we subsequently learned worshipped Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, even Ho Chi Minh. And we didn't know enough to say, let's see if we can talk this through. Those kids on the Vietnam Memorial all represent a tragic story in the way in which each of the people in the Iliad who die represent a tragic story. Let their lives and their deaths mean something. Learn to be empathetic. Towards the Arabs? Yeah. Towards the Arabs. Well, that's what's going on in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And we want to look at the, this famous passage, so we'll go to the Iliad. <coughs> Again, before we do, and here is the evening prayer for Pentecost. Here is the evening prayer for Pentecost. It's from uh, Psalm 147, from my good Benedictine uh, Divine Office. The Lord brings back Israel's exile. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up all their wounds. <coughs> the Lord raises the lowly. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He provides the beasts with their food plants to serve men's needs. His delight is not in horses, nor his pleasure in warriors' strengths. The Lord delights in those who revere him and who wait for his love. He brings back the exile, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds, he raises the lowly, and his delight is not in horses. The last words in the Iliad are breaker of horses. Those of you who've seen the movie The Horse Whisperer know that there is something in human nature that is um, satisfied when a horse is made to obey a human command. And when we have a statue of Napoleon on a horse or George Washington on a horse, it's a symbolic way of saying, this man conquered his animal nature. There, there's a mastery in horses that's extraordinary. There's even a college in the United States where your degree is given for mastering the horse. It's in Virginia. <laughs> and and the, Greeks, the Greek sense of themselves, are, we are the breakers of horses. We have learned to control the animal. And then the Hebrew answers back, the Lord delights not in horses. Don't worry about uh, that kind of force that you use to break a horse. Just worry about have you raised up the lowly, because that's what I do. We have an uh, unspeakable advantage when we're dealing with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, the people in the Iliad and the Odyssey are people who didn't have anything near the insight we have, they, they were far from Judaism, they were far from Christianity. You take, you take something as simple in Christianity as the following, which we make a hymn of, as the Father has loved me, I love you. We hear that all the time. And we don't understand that what that those words say is whatever the 
incredible love is between Father and Son in the Trinity. Without diminution of any kind, that's ours. As the Father has loved me, I love you. You are God's equal. Whatever the richness of the love is that exists between Father and Son that caused the whole world to be created, that identical, same, deliberate love is ours. After the story of the Garden of Eden were God's creatures. After the crucifixion were Jesus' brothers and sisters. Entitled to everything. We can't, under, can't believe it. A saint is a person who just accepts the words. The rest of us go around saying, well, there must be some rhetoric to that. There's no rhetoric to that. What do you have to do to be a part of this love where I accept you in the same way that the Father accepts me? Just love one another. Just take the lonely in. Just forgive everyone. That's ours. The Greeks didn't have that, and yet they made an incredible leap forward in this passage we're going to look at now, so let's uh, finally look at it. I've got your book too, Melissa, to read something out of it. I've got to get to this first. <laughs> Iliad, book 19, is that right? Book 21. <coughs> Let's start on page uh, 404. Or oh, we'll even start on page 402. 402. Achilles had a relationship. Achilles had a relationship with Patroclus that is the closest relationship in the Iliad. The closest thing in the Bible to it is uh, uh, Jonathan and David. Uh, that there was a relationship there in which they accepted each other as more than brothers. Uh, that there was, it was one of those friendships that are just absolutely spectacular in which uh, each knew how the other would act and each knew how to respond to the other. It's an extraordinary and very healthy idea of a uh, male relationship. It's very, very beautiful. And it's very strong. And when Patroclus is taken, when Patroclus is taken, Achilles goes bonkers. 402, uh, there are lines uh, of, uh, lines 500, 11, 12, and 13 are in italics, you'll notice. They're in italics only in this edition of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Those are called Homeric similes. That's how you know the Iliad if you're given a four or five pieces of uh, poetry, and uh, you see one with these ex their extended similes. Some of them go on for 14 and 15, 16 lines. And then Homeric simile is a simile in which, instead of saying, my love is a red, red rose, Homer starts to tell what something is like, and then gets caught up in what the thing is like, and, and leaves you then with a taste both for what he's trying to describe and for the event that he uses as a comparison. That's called a Homeric simile, and it's the outstanding stylistic mark of the Iliad, uh, and there are books written on it. Here's the simile. So the, the simile, we forget that it's about Achilles. We don't have to know it's about Achilles because it's strong enough to stand on its own. That's why Lombardo has put it in italics. Fire raging through a parched forest in a mountain valley when the wind rises and spirals the flame in every direction. That's just when you've all seen clips on CNN of that terrible moment when a forest fire starts and you see it sweep these people coming in, aircraft and dumping things on it. Fire raging through a parched forest in a mountain valley when the wind rises and 
the spirals, the flame in every direction. And the strength of the simile brings us into a mountain and we forget about that we're in the Iliad. And then, then the, you see that that simile is the subject of a sentence. The fire raging through a part of the forest in a mountain valley when the wind rises and spirals the flames in every direction will give you some idea of Achilles' presence as the black earth ran with blood. You want to know what happened to him when he lost Patroclus? Just feel the terror of a fire in a national park when the wind gets a hold of it and pushes it through the parched pine trees. That's what Achilles was like. A team of broad browed oxen has been yoked and is now treading white barley on a solid threshing floor. It does not take long for the bellowing bulls to tread out the grain. That's a simile from a peaceful thing. <laughs> That's peaceful. Have you ever been to a threshing mill in which you watch um, oxen uh, move around on a circle floor yoked to a center in which they uh, take the uh, wheat out of the seeds and uh, uh, make it edible for human consumption? That's a beautiful scene from that, that something that gives delight. That gives delight. Stand by and watch as the uh, kicks and the Cheerios are made. <laughs> and, and, and not only does that give delight, but just that beautiful thing, the broad, broad borrowed oxen. The wonderful sense of uh, looking at a, a cow, just the broadness of the brow between the two eyes. It takes delight in that. So the simile brings you back to something that's delightful. A team of broad, brown oxen has been yoked and is now treading white barley on a solid fleshing floor. It does not take long for the bellowing bulls to tread out the grain. That treading was what Achilles did now, except it wasn't on grain, it was the human body. So the hoof of Achilles' horses trampled dead bodies and shields, and the chariot's axle and rails were splashed with blood, and kicked up by the wheels and horses' hooves. But the son of Peleus pressed on to glory, his invincible hands spattered with gore. So one image from the natural world, fire, another image from peace. Both of those can be used to say what war is all about and about the terrible anger of Achilles. Right now, there's another one on page 403. Fire, it's about line 17, will sometimes cause a swarm of locusts to rise in the air and fly to a river. Think of that wonderful scene even in the Walt Disney movie on Bambi where the fire comes and you have this absolute horror in the faces of all the cartoon animals there as fire and licks of fire come after them. Fire will sometimes cause a swarm of locusts to rise in the air and fly to a river. The fire keeps coming, burning them instantly. And the insects, insects shrink down into the water. Just so. He was like that fire. He didn't care what was in his path. So you have a sense here, on page 404, just one line I want to give you, line uh, 39, 404. And Achilles returned to his killing frenzy. And he met a son of Priam. You know that he's going to get it. So Achilles is, uh, to put it mildly, not in good shape. And it, this goes on for uh, three or four uh, long uh, chapters. Then we come to this scene that we've been trying to uh, get to all along. Oh, I don't know. That's I want to go to book 
24 now. So we go from book 21 to 20, and it's just one time after another Achilles killing people and showing us his uh, uh, rancor, his, his uh, anger. Let's start with page 468. Uh, the gods look down on what uh, Achilles is doing. You go down to about line 43, 44, 45, 40, line 45 on uh, this page. And uh, you can see this in a film, but not in the film Troy, uh, that I'm going to show you now. This is the gods commenting on Achilles. The line begins, his twisted mind is set on what he wants. As savage as a lion bristling with pride, attacking men's flocks to make himself a feast. That's what Achilles is. He has lost all pity and has no shame left. In the movie Lawrence of Arabia, there is a moment in which that happens. This extraordinary young Englishman who has developed an empathy for the Arabs and has learned their language, who's a true character, T.E. Lawrence is a true character, he's written a book called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. A man who uh, was a non-commissioned officer in the British Army, went to Egypt, fell in love with all things Arabic, and led the Arabs on an independence movement in which he said, the thing that's wrong with uh, Islam is that you don't have confidence in yourselves as persons. I tell you, you are beautiful. Stop wrangling and just accept your beauty. And the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, come after the Arabs that are forming uh, in Saudi Arabia and do some horrible things to them. And uh, Lawrence himself is taken captive by a Turkish officer who is uh, perverse. And after that moment in the film, he becomes as bloodthirsty as the people who yeah, he's fighting. And there's a terrible moment in the film where you focus on Lawrence O'Toole. He's gone absolutely berserk. He kills women, children, doesn't care who it is. And it's this Achilles in a frenzy here. He knows no shame. And, 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 it, and it's happened to us in war, too, probably more often than we want to uh, realize. So now we have a sense of who Achilles is. And now we'll go to uh, page 482. So we'll start at the bottom of 481, the last two lines. Kids in class love this when I do this. I say, we're going to open to page 482 today. <laughs> Listen, but before we do that, let's go back to page 1. <laughs> <laughs> Will you prepare your lessons? <laughs> Priam is the leader of Troy. His son Hector is the individual who has killed Patroclus. Achilles' frenzy is finally at least partially satisfied when he kills Hector. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And not only does he kill him, but he says, I'm going to disfigure that body more than anybody has ever been disfigured in human history. If you think for a moment, I don't want to meditate too long on this. That's happened twice to us in the past 10 years. And we don't understand you. What kind of people would dismember and disfigure a human body? Isn't it enough to kill our troops? Who would do that? A person who's been very deeply hurt. No, a person who's evil would do that. No, a person who's very deeply hurt. And the hurt has caused the evil. So here's Priam, whose son, Hector, has been killed by Achilles, and Achilles is busy seeing how many ways he can disfigure the body. And the old man went straight to the house, 481, where Achilles, dear to Zeus, sat and waited. And Priam found Achilles inside. I'm top of 482 now. 
Achilles' companions set apart from him, and a solitary pair, Automedon and Alcimus, warriors both, were busy at his side. He had just finished his evening meal. The table was still set up. Great Priam, the father of Hector, entered unnoticed. Imagine the wife of Daniel Pearl, who was misfigured, uh, disfigured, going over uh, to uh, an Islamic country and saying, I want my husband back undisfigured. He had just finished his evening meal. The table was still set up. Great Priam entered unnoticed. He stood close to Achilles, and touching his knees, he kissed the dread and murderous hands that had killed so many of his sons. Then a Homeric simile. Passion sometimes blinds a man so completely that he kills one of his countrymen. In exile, the killer comes into a wealthy house, and everyone stares at him with wonder. How could you dare? Let me put it turn to Jack and Kenna. How could you dare who left your own children with your sister appear here in front of us? In exile, he comes into a wealthy house, and everyone stares at him with wonder. That's the way Achilles stared in wonder at Priam. Was he a god? Could any person so humble himself as to come in and kiss the hands of the person who had killed not only Hector, but the others of his sons? And the others there stared and wondered and looked at each other, but Priam spoke a prayer of entreaty, a prayer of what McNamara would call empathy. He doesn't say, have pity on me, Achilles. He does not say, have pity on me, Achilles. He does not say, have pity on me, Achilles. Remember your father. Priam understands that if he can get Achilles to understand his human condition, then he has a chance to get him to act as a human being. The same A plus B equals C plus D. If I can get you to see, Achilles, that your relationship with your father is what I am feeling now for my son, maybe I can get you to act in a beautiful rather than a revengeful way. Look what that means for us. Our relationship with the Father through Christ is such that God the Father loves us exactly the same way he loves his Son because the Son has told him to do it. How then could we be angry at anyone? Or is it just that we don't understand what was told us as the Father has loved I love you. The problem is you can't hear me. The problem is you can't hear me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? As the Father has loved me, all the riches of all creation that he puts in my hands, I now put in yours. You're misreading the gospel. No, I am not. I'm telling you that you and I both don't see it. And that's exactly what Homer puts in his own way into this encounter between Achilles and Priam. A plus B equals C plus D. If we're loved with all the riches that God the Father loves Christ, why can't we go and do the same for somebody else? Remember your father, godlike Achilles? He and I both are on the doorstep of old age. 
He may well be now surrounded by enemies wearing him down. It's the message of, of the Jew Shylock, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. Hath not a Jew eyes? Do you think Jews don't go home and weep and cry over the death of someone they love? Do you think Iraqis are so bad that they don't feel the things that you feel in the intimacy of family life? He and I are both on the doorstep of old age. He may well be now surrounded by enemies wearing him down and have no one to protect him from harm. The psychology here is brilliant. Just look at your own dad. Just look at your own relationship to God before you act. But then he hears that you are still alive and his heart rejoices. And he hopes all his days to see his dear son come back from Troy. See how good you've got it, Achilles, you could go back. But what about me? I have the finest sons in all wide Troy, and not one of them is left. Fifty. Came over 19 out of one belly. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, there's a problem with the Greeks. <laughs> 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 and, the, and the rest, you've got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> 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 And the rest of the women in my house bore to me. Well, I bet that makes your wife feel good. <laughs> we have in the Old Testament, you know, the Abraham, uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah, by the way, where uh, Sarah says to Abraham, I'm not be able to produce you a son. And uh, why don't you go and sleep with one of the local women here? And he goes and does that and has a son whose name is Ishmael. Do you know who Ishmael is? the founder of Islam. So it goes all the way back. If Sarah had had a little more trust and had understood the olive tree and the olive branch, maybe we wouldn't be in the trouble we had. It was back that far. Even before, we, even before Islam was created, Ishmael forms the tribes that Muhammad converts to Islam. But when I was in an Arab country, um, I was teaching the word sacrifice. And when you're, when you're a language teacher, wonderful ways to teach through story. And I said, uh, Abraham was a great man. Everyone like, yes, 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 yes. Abraham was a great man. He was an Islamic country. He sacrificed his son, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> Kids ran out of the room. I noticed that the faculty were gathering outside of the room. And I said, how have they done now? <laughs> Just give them a little bit of biblical history. I knew that uh, Abraham was important to the uh, um, Islamic religion. He's in the Koran, so is Isaac. And um, uh, I came out of the classroom, and there was a real anger there. And the, the class was over. Uh, once I'd given that word out, the class was over. It was this very stately imam or um, Islamic priest. We didn't speak any French, and he pulled one of the other faculty over. And 